the first thing I need to say is welcome and thank you for being here. And I need to also offer a, a bit of an apology. Last week, we had 8,200 plus people watch this. <laughs> and so uh, when we live Facebook streamed it, so hi. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how many are watching tonight, but uh, it could be that many. And I had a fair bit of feedback, and some of it was, I don't want to say negative, it was more, wow, pastor, that was, that was like eating a rich chocolate cake, and it was like way too much. It was good, 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 but too much. And I got to thinking about that, and, you know, some of it was a, a little bit stronger than that. And, and I got to thinking about it. It was, it was something I need to, to realize that I am quite passionate about apologetics. I love science. I love that sort of thing. But we're talking about stuff that's not really related to that. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take the science stuff. So some of you might be disappointed in what I'm about to say because, um, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. So when I looked at the message series that I have here tonight, we're supposed to be talking about marriage. Next week, we're talking about kids. Well, October 1st, it says, it's supposed to be keeping it together in your mind. And I did have it in my mind that that's where I was going to be putting most of my science stuff, you know, the apologetic stuff. But the reason I tried to thread it in last week was because there's too much to do in one night. Don't you hate that? There's just a lot of good stuff out there. So I'm just going to have to be content with less is more, and I'm going to have to take the science stuff and shove it into October 1st. So if that disappoints some of you, I am sorry. But I, like I said, I can't please all of the people all the time. So um, maybe if, if enough of you want me to, we could continue, that we could extend this a little bit maybe and do more of the apologetics thing. We'll see what you think towards the end of, of what we're doing here. But in the meantime... What I'm going to do is I'm going to start this evening with a little story. Now, there was a guy, his name was Joseph Hodges Chote. Joseph Hodges Chote. He was a, an American lawyer. He was a diplomat. He was uh, uh, made into the ambassador to the United Kingdom from 1899 to 1905. He died in 1917. So he was, he was a very famous person in his day. Um, and uh, he got married to a woman named Carolyn Dutcher Sterling. And they were married for more than 50 years. Now, Joseph was a very popular guy. He was very personable. He was a true gentleman. He had a, a real quick wit. He was uh, somebody that the journalist at that time loved because they were able to get, a, a, you know, a sound bite, if you want to call it that, in before, days before radio, and get it into the newspaper. He always had something great to say. And one day, when he was getting older, somebody, one of these journalists said, Mr. Chote, if you were not yourself, who would you most like to be? And without a second's hesitation, he said, Mrs. Chote's second husband. And he smiled. Mrs. Chote's second husband. You see, a great marriage, how many of you know a great marriage is something we all long for? It's a blessing. It's something that's good. It's something we write novels about. It's something that we, we make movies about. We, we, we long for it. We always say, oh, when you have a story like that. And the truth is, Great marriages don't just happen. There, there's this false thing going on in our world today that we fall in love as if it's an accident. I fell. I tripped over something. And, and we have this, this notion out there that, that a great marriage and a great relationship is something you just fall into or it's, it's some kind of magic or, or it's a, some spiritual thing. You know, I finally met my soulmate or whatever it is. There's this worldly thing out there that completely misunderstands what it takes to really keep it together in a great marriage. But the Bible has a lot to say about how to have a great marriage. And I can't cover it all in one night. 
But I'm gonna give you some of, the, some of the gems from what the Bible teaches about how to have a great marriage. Now, the very first thing you need to understand about marriage, about what it takes to have a great marriage, and this sounds simplistic, but it's a foundational truth. It's something you need to put into your heart. It's something you need to own. It's something you need to take as the foundation for everything that I'm about to say. The truth of the matter is, God created marriage. It's God that invented it. It was his idea. Now, getting back to my science thing for a second, if you are just the product of some mindless millions of years of evolution, then you're just an animal. And what do animals do? They just mate and take off. I mean, occasionally you get some that mate for life or whatever, but by instinct, but there's, there's no marriage out there. There's no, there's no commitment. There's no real relationship. Animals are just animals. They do what animals do. And there's too many people in our world today that believe that relationships should be based just on whatever your feeling is in the moment. That is not how to create a great marriage. It's not how to create a great relationship. You need to start with the foundational truth that it is God who invented this. He created men, he created women, and then he put them together in a, in a relationship, a committed relationship, a marriage relationship right from the beginning. Take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says very clearly, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created them. It's making it very clear right from the beginning that the human race was created in the image of God. Now, what that means is, is that we're supposed to reflect who he is. That's what an image is, right? God is in relationship within himself. We have learned that over time, that, that, that there is one God, but he exists in a trinity. There is a relationship within himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is in eternal relationship. He is a relational being. This is an extremely important concept to get in your head if you want to have a great marriage. You were intended for relationship. You were created for relationship right from the beginning. Now, you're created in the image of God. That tells me several things. First of all, I should be able to look at any one of you and say, that is what God is like. And none of us like this because we don't look like God. We don't sound like God. We don't think like God. And we don't act like God. We wish we did. And sometimes we say we do, but we certainly don't act it out. Isn't that right? Somebody say, that's true. Okay, I just want to make sure you're all listening. Now, the other thing about the image of God is that we should be in a relationship that is fulfilling and deep. So that means that we long for it when we don't have it. It's not good for us to be alone. And it's not just about marriage, but, but connecting not only with God, but with one another. We are designed for this. We're designed for this. That is the foundation of what it means to have a great marriage. But I also want you to look at the second half of this. It says made in the image of God, but it says male and female. There is a distinction between these two. In other words, men reflect something about who God is in a way that is different from the way women reflect who God is. This is extremely important to grasp because our culture is trying to blur the lines between men and women. It's trying to say that men don't have to be men if they don't want to be, and women don't have to be women if they don't want to be, and men and women are basically the same anyways. Now, I, I, I have no problem, biblically speaking, with the concept of quote-unquote equality. I really don't. I believe that human beings, male and female, since they're created in the image of God, they have equal right to dignity. 
They have an equal right to human rights. I have no problem with this. I have no problem with, if you do that job, you should get the same pay regardless of what your gender is. I have no issue with this. And the Bible has no issue with this. But there is a distinct difference between how men are supposed to reflect the image of God and how women do. They are wired differently. How many of you know they think differently? I mean, no matter how many times the whole world tries to tell you, oh, no, 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 they're all the same. No, they're not. Anybody who has been around for longer than 20 seconds realizes that women are weird. They don't get it. They don't think right. I'm constantly fighting this problem. Everybody's laughing at me for some reason, you know? But there is a distinct difference between men and women. Now, let's take a look at where this goes. Jump down to Genesis chapter 20, verse, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 1, this is a mistake, verse 21. Or is it 2 verse 21? It's not 20, I can tell you that. Anyway, it says this. This must be a typo on my part. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, wow, that, that, that's in the Hebrew there somewhere. But anyway, it says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I'm sure he said that. How many of you guys know that he said that? Okay, but anyway, it's not, in, it's not here, but it's, I'm reading between the lines. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his uh, mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, what's interesting here, there's a lot of interesting things here, but one of the things that stands out to me is it says, she shall be called woman. Now, in our language, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't stand out to you. But So we're gonna have to step back into the Hebrew language in order to really get the sense of what Adam was saying here. You gotta notice that the woman was created for a very specific purpose. And that purpose was to be Adam's wife, not just a mating partner. She was specifically created for a specific purpose, and that was to be Adam's wife. Now, the word woman here in Hebrew is isha. Now, the word ish in Hebrew means man. The word isha means woman. But there's something more to it than that. When you dig a little bit deeper into the Hebrew language, you'll find out that isha comes from a root word, which is also used for a sacrificial animal. Now, why is that important? Because according to God's word, the Bible, when you get into it, you will find that, that God makes it very clear that he is holy. God makes it very clear that there is no one like him, no one higher than he is. So when you, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, when you brought a sacrifice to his altar, God had a certain expectation. How many of you know what it is? It had to be the very, very best that you had. God was not into, I mean, if you had a flock of sheep and you looked at your flock, you had 20 in the flock and you went and found the least expensive, the sickest one, the one you're not gonna miss, that's not the one you bring to God's altar. But a lot of people wanna do that. They wanna give their leftovers as always whatever is second hand because they don't value um, whatever it is they're giving to when they give it second hand. I mean, no kidding. If we go to goodwill, I mean, honestly, we're giving what we don't have use for anymore. Maybe somebody else has use for that, but, it, but it's no longer useful to us. So it's not gonna be the best. We don't go to goodwill, and usually we don't, and, and, and give brand new stuff that we've never used, do we? And God is saying, I'm not goodwill. God is making it very plain that you, you wouldn't exist if I hadn't thought you up. You didn't ask to be born. And when you come to make a, a sacrifice at my altar to say, I believe in you, 
and, and I want to be connected with you, then you bring the very, very best that you have. You look at your flock of sheep, for example. You got 20 sheep. You find the one that all of your kids are going to cry if you take that one. The very, very best one that you have the most expensive, the most precious, the most valuable, that's the one that you bring to my altar. So there's a clue here just in the name. Now, I bring this up and I go into great detail because what God is saying here is he's saying that, you know, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife. And God is saying, look, I, 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 you know, I led you to name her Isha so that you would get it in your head that your wife is the most valuable thing you have. Nothing else except me comes close. See, there's too many of us that we get into our marriages, we get into our relationships, and it was all exciting, and it was wonderful at first. But, but, but with familiarity, how many of you heard that? With familiarity breeds contempt. And over time, we don't value our wife the way we once did. And if, I, if I'm honest, it goes the other way too. We don't value the husband as much as we once did. And what God is trying to get it into our heads to understand right from the beginning is that not only did he, you want to have a great marriage, understand this, not only did I create marriage, says God, but, but I, right in the name of who a woman is, you need to get it in your head that this is the most valuable relationship that I allow you to have. It needs to be the highest priority. See, there's too many people that get into a marriage relationship and their kids have a higher priority than their spouse. This is backwards. Their job is a higher priority than their spouse. This is incorrect. Their friends are a higher priority than their spouse. You want to keep it all together in a marriage, you have got to recognize that God himself, right in the very name of the woman he created, is making it clear that that relationship must be the highest priority you have in your life next to your relationship with God. It truly must be God, then your spouse, period. And gentlemen, it starts with you. It starts with you. You're supposed to lead this. You value your wife more than anything or anyone in your life except God himself. This is the most valuable relationship you have, the most important person you have. Just like if you were to bring a sacrifice to the altar, it would be the very, very best that you have. Now, we also said at the beginning of this, that God was making it clear that he created men and women differently and for a different purpose. So let's get into this a little bit deeper. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, and we'll see how we're supposed to apply this. And it says in that scripture, it says, each one of you, speaking to men, must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, these are, these are truths. There's a, little, there's a little nugget in here that you need to get a hold of. It says that husbands must love their wives. Now, for most of us as men, at first, at first glance, that seems pretty easy because she was so darn attractive when you first met, you were falling all over yourself trying to get, you know, trying to get with her. So that seems easy, right? But we're misunderstanding the word love if, uh, if, we, uh, if we go there. And then I also want you to notice that there's something missing here. It does not say, and the wife must love her husband. You would think it would because it says, you know, husbands love your wives. You would think it would also say, wives love your husbands, but it doesn't. It says wives must respect their husbands. And there's a reason for this. How many of you know that women don't need to be told to love? They love puppies and kitties and kids and everything easily. They do it naturally. 
They're always cuddling something or somebody. I mean, that's what women do. They're wired that way. They don't need to be told to love. Now, respect. A lot of laughter here. I think you're getting the point. But men, men are exactly the opposite to this, aren't we, boys? You know, the whole love, respect, that's easy. You get a whole bunch of men together, they start pounding on each other's shoulders long enough and insulting one another. We kind of get this pecking order going, figure out who's the alpha dog. We understand the concept of respect. No problem, we got that one. Love, different animal, whole different animal. I mean, it is relatively rare for men to say, I love you, dude, unless we want something. <laughs> respect is a different animal. Man earns respect with other men, and there's this big hero thing going on in our hearts, and we're like, yeah, it's the man, you know what I mean? We, we understand respect, we thrive on it, we need it like we need to breathe. And guys, you need to get it in your head that your wife is wired completely differently. Completely differently. That's why this scripture says this. It's not an accident. This is not a mistake. Now, to, to give credit where credit is due, I do want to say that I got a lot of this from Dr. Emerson Edricks and his book, Love and Respect. I want to give credit where credit is due. Now, I did give a lot of, I got a lot of that before I read his book. It just kind of gave me a lot of this information. But again, if you want to get this in greater detail, I recommend his book highly. And um, so, I, I, you know, again, I don't want, to, want you all to think that I came up with this. But here's what's interesting about it is that God came up with this. I mean, this was written in the book of Ephesians long before there were psychologists, long before anybody went, wait a minute, men and women are different, okay? But God knew it. That's why he inspired the Holy Spirit to get it written this way. The truth of the matter is, if you want to keep it together in your marriage, you got to get it in your head that men need to feel respected, honored, admired. They need to feel like a hero. They need it so bad. They need it like they need to breathe or to drink water. And when they don't get it, they feel like they're starving or, or, or suffocating. And when the person they love the most is tearing them down, is, 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 is you know, pointing out all their faults all the time, stepping on their respect hose so badly they can't breathe, that's not helping your relationship, ladies. It's not helping it at all. Now, there's a lot of women that want to say, well, you know, when my husband earns respect, then I will give it to him. So let's flip that. When you earn love, he should give it to you, right? Oh, well, wait a minute. Girls don't think that way. No, 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 he's supposed to love me, period. But what if you don't deserve it? How many of you know there are times you don't deserve it, especially once every 28 days? I mean, let's be honest what? We're all adults here. Let's figure this out. There's some times you don't deserve it. Any hands? Is there anybody honest in here? Oh, there's one. Oh, there's two. Good. There's some honest ladies. There's some times you don't deserve it. But gentlemen, you're commanded to love your wife regardless of how nice she's being today. Why? Because your wife needs to feel loved. It's wired into her. She naturally loves puppies and kitties and kids and everything else. And she desperately needs to feel loved. And you can see this in our culture. It's all around. It's, it's the women that go to the Hallmark store and they can't pick a card because they're all wonderful. And they're going, oh, this one. Okay. Guys go in and go, that's good. We're out of here, man. We got stuff to do. And that one's three bucks. We're in. We didn't even read it. Half the time we're handing it to the girl and, and she goes, oh, this is so wonderful. Really? What does it say? <laughs> you know, oh, you don't want to say that. But anyway, but we're like that. But women naturally need to feel love, guys. Get it in your head. Your wife needs it like she needs to breathe. And if you don't understand that, if you don't step into that, you're not going to have a flourishing marriage. Quit trying to make your wife into you. And ladies, quit trying to make your husband into you. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. It's God that made this. 
It's God that made them men and women. He made them differently to reflect him differently. So let's quit trying to make the other person into us. Let's recognize how they are wired and start acting accordingly. And when you do that, then your marriage is going to begin to flourish. That's, that's the center of what it means to have a great marriage. Now, let's get into this a little bit deeper. Now, it says, men, you're supposed to love your wife. So let's go into that word love here. In, uh, in Greek, it's agape. And what it means is an unselfish or a sacrificial love. But it's deeper than that. Agape means to, um, to seek to look for, to strive for the highest and the very best interest of someone else at your own cost. Let me say that again. It's to seek the highest and the best interest of someone else at your own cost, at your own extreme cost. That's a whole lot deeper than, wow, she's cute, right? That's a whole lot deeper than she's attractive. That's a whole lot deeper than she makes me feel good when we were dating. That's a whole lot deeper than what it felt like on the day you said, I do. For those of you that are not yet married and you're thinking about it and you've got the romantic notions in your mind, that's a whole lot deeper than romance. It's a whole lot deeper than candlelight. It's something that goes way beyond that. It is an utter commitment from your heart that says, I will pour myself sacrificially into making that person feel loved. That's what it means. Gentlemen, you're commanded to do something that's extraordinary and difficult. It's a challenge. It's the ultimate mountain to conquer. It's the ultimate adventure to go on, that you can love this person when they're not easy to love when you're burdened by your job, when you're burdened by your own feelings of inadequacy, and yet you sacrifice yourself almost to the extreme. Well, in fact, to the extreme to make sure that your, love, your wife feels loved all the time. That's what you're commanded to do. And that is hard. But it's a mindset and it's an attitude that reflects who God is. See, God loves the human race. And how many of you know, we don't deserve it? Not even a little bit. We have raped this planet. We have murdered one another. We have destroyed and clawed at each other to get our own way. We've allowed the me monsters within us to rule this planet. And yet God loves us. In fact, God loves us with a sacrificial love that is so extreme that he gave his own son to pay for crimes that we committed. Now, my friends, I have three sons, and I would not give one for any of you. But God gave his only son. That's agape. And you, gentlemen, you want to have a great marriage? You need to model that. And yes, that's a bar so high you can't reach it. So you need to be constantly in a connection with the God who is agape in order for you to have the strength to carry on another day learning to love your wife that much deeper. You want to have a great marriage? That's what you got to do. And when you fail, you got to get up and brush yourself off and keep loving your wife. And when, when you do it wrong and, and you forget it and you get into a monumental fight and you say 46 things that you really wish you didn't say, you've got to ask for forgiveness and humble yourself and go back and say, I will continue to try to love you even when I'm not worthy of loving you. Because that's what God would do. You reflect the image of God. But ladies, you are not off the hook. I went after the men because I is one. So who am I preaching at? Somebody say, you, pastor. Ah, because I'm married. So you know what? This part's for you, Melissa. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> <laughs> 
Now, if you want to keep it all together, look, husbands, love your wives. Why? Because God designed women to feel this need to be loved and cherished. But let's go into the woman's side. It says, ladies, you are supposed to respect your husband. In fact, it's stronger in the King James Version. It actually translates this because of the Greek. It says, wives, see to it that you respect your husband. I mean, it's a lot stronger in Greek. Why? Because girls, how many of you are willing to admit that's hard? I mean, the longer he keeps putting his underwear there, oh, man. I mean, the number of times my wife has said to me, if you, <laughs> I don't even want to go into it, <laughs> okay. But she has admitted to me that respecting me is a chore. It's a difficulty. Guess what? It's a sacrifice. Hmm. Doesn't that sound like agape? It does, doesn't it? You also reflect the image of God. You see, men, we reflect the image of God. God is a warrior. God is powerful. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we reflect that side. There's a side to all men that's just a little bit dangerous, and we kind of like it that way. You know, don't mess with me. Don't hurt my wife. Don't touch my kids. You know, we've got that. We reflect the image of God because God says, you know what? I'm coming back. And when I am, I'm mad and I'm gonna judge, judge this planet. We're going, yeah. Okay, because there's, there's, there's a part of us. We reflect it. But you know, there's another part of God. Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem. He said, oh, I wanted so much to just gather you under my wings like a, like a hen gathering the chicks, but, but you were not willing. His heart breaks for those that have betrayed him and wandered away from the truth. There's a part of God that loves so deeply that the poetry that we find in the word of God comes from the heart of God that sings with love, with care. You ladies reflect that. How many of you know that God is in fact, the Bible says that God is so beautiful that you could not comprehend how beautiful. You think the stars are beautiful? God's going, <laughs> nothing compared to my glory. And I, 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 I'm here to tell you, and I'm not saying this just because I'm on tape. I'm saying it because it's true. The most beautiful thing in the world to me is Melissa Marks. Nothing comes close. Nothing. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. God is reflected in your beauty, ladies. Why do you think you want to be beautiful? You want to be beautiful. I mean, from the time you're this tall, you're doing dress up in princess costumes, right? You want to be beautiful because God is beautiful. You reflect him. You want to love because God loves. You reflect his image in a very special and powerful way that men don't. It's a different way. But what we got to understand about that, girls, is that just like for men, it's not, it's not wired into their nature to love. We have to be commanded to love because we'll forget about it. We're busy being a hero. We're busy slaying something and dragging it back to the cave. That's what we do. We're going to forget all about love. We're going to forget all about cherishing. We're to, we have to be commanded and reminded because we're dense, because we're busy killing something and dragging it back to the cave. That's what we do. But girls, you've got a problem too. You, you are wired to love. You are wired to be beautiful. You're wired to do all of those things. And if you're not careful with that, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to become completely conceited with that. How many of you know girls like that? Or you're going to completely ref forget the whole respect thing. That, that's going to go right out the window. That's not on your mind. Now, this is really, really important. It says, um, you need to respect your husband. In fact, let's take a look at 1 Peter 3, 7, because this will give you a little bit more detail on, on what he's talking about here. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this, that husbands, in the same way, be considerate, as you live with your wives and treat them with respect 
as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And everybody cringes. We don't like that verse. It's very politically incorrect, isn't it? But it's going to help you ladies to understand what the word respect means. It's going to help you with this word. Now, let's take a look at it. It says, as heirs with you. That implies equality. So he's not saying that this weaker vessel concept or, or you know, is somehow your inferior. That's not what he means. In fact, the word here, weaker vessel, means in Greek, a difference in substance. It doesn't mean inferior. It means a difference in substance. Now, we're going to start connecting the dots here. Step back for a second. It says, ladies, see to it that you respect your husband. That word respect in Greek, and I didn't put it up here, but the word respect in Greek is phobos, from which we get our word, say it with me, phobia, fear. It says, wives, see to it that you have a reverential fear for your husband. Why? because you are made with a different substance. Let's go into this in a little bit more detail so you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's not talking about inferiority. See, the truth is, men and women are genetically, psychologically, spiritually, and physically different. They're made of different substances. Everybody knows that boys are made of snails and puppy dog tails and all that, right? And girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice, right? We all know this. It's right in the, it's right in the children's rhyme. It's right there. In other words, what he's trying to say is that girls, get it in your head that you're made differently. It's kind of like you're both containers. Does that make sense? You're both containers. You both have the spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the spirit of God residing in you. You're a container. But there's a difference between these two containers. That's a rusty bucket. That is a crystal vase. <laughs> they are made of different substances. They are both containers. They have the equal dignity of saying, I am a container. But they are made of different substances and they have very different uses. Now I'm here to tell you that you can change the oil in your truck with that crystal vase. It's possible. It's a bad plan, but you can do it. Now, how many of you know that it's a whole lot safer to use the rusty bucket when you're going to be out banging it around in the backyard and doing things and grabbing this and doing that? You take care of the crystal vase. Both containers different, made of different substances. It's not about inferiority. In fact, if you look at it closely, which one would we actually value more? Well, for the most part, we would go, well, the crystal vase, sure. But it's not even about value because if you need to change the oil in your truck, that rusty bucket is very valuable. So it's not about value, it's about substance. It's about what it was designed to do. So let's take it backwards a little bit. And it says, wives, you're supposed to respect your husband. Why? Because he's made of a completely different substance and he has a completely different need. He needs to feel honored. He needs to feel respected. He needs to feel useful. He's the rusty bucket. He doesn't mind being kicked around as long as it's for a good use. <laughs> Seriously. Look, I, I, I'm a blue-collar guy. I, I grew up in the logging business. I'm a tree trimmer by trade. That's what I do, or, well, not as much anymore, but I did it yesterday. I killed two trees. But anyway, the thing is, I can get beat up, sore from head to foot, sawdust in my eyes, and just the smell of gas and oil and the sweat and all of the stuff that I go through and I can go through that. I can deal with that. I can handle that. I can live with that. If my wife says, wow, thank you for working so hard to put food on this table. When I feel respected, when I feel honored, I'll beat myself near to death. 
And ladies, you want to have a great marriage. You want to keep it together. You need to affirm your man. You need to make him feel respected because God designed him to need to feel dignified, affirmed, useful, a hero. You know, last week I made bread. I did. It took an hour of kneading. That was harder than taking down a tree. But I made bread. And the reason I made bread is because my wife is working 60 hours a week trying to get going on her new job and things. And so I thought, I want to do something special. So I made it, and I made the bread, you know. And it turned out great, only because it's my mom's recipe and she guided me through the whole thing, but don't tell her that. Anyway, I made the bread. And my wife comes home, fresh bread. And she comes, looks at me, she takes this bread. And she came right up to me and she put it right here and she goes, you're my hero, and I am melted because I felt useful and affirmed. Ladies, you want to have a great marriage? Make your man feel like he's the biggest man since, oh, he's bigger than Arnold, man. This guy doesn't have a, doesn't have a, not, not, not even close to your man. You see, when you affirm, when you build him up, when you have a marriage like that, it's going it's to be, it's going to flourish. It's going to go somewhere. But when a man feels torn down, you know, you, this, this is important because we, we can fall into a trap and that trap is called the crazy cycle. Let's take a look at this. Uh, this is the trap. I think it's not the next slide. I think it's the next one over. Next one. Crazy cycle. Now, here's how the crazy cycle works, guys. Figure this out. Without love, your wife is going to react without respect. That happens. If your wife feels dis, uh, you know, you know, if she feels no love, she's going to use that tongue like a weapon and start tearing you to shreds. And how many of you men know that your wife's tongue is scarier than a guy with a gun? Because a guy with a gun, you just shoot back. But with her, you cower. Why? Because when you feel disrespected, you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you're getting torn down. But you know what, ladies? This is a problem. I know you're not feeling loved. You're feeling, you're, you're feeling like you can't breathe, and, and so you just go, ah, because you can't feel it. So... When he feels disrespected, though, he's going to react without love. He's going to come back and go, punch, <laughs> verbally or whatever. He's not going to react with love because he's feeling disrespected. And when you get on this crazy cycle, it goes round, 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 round. And that's what kills your marriage. And it's right in the Bible. Guys, love your wives because when you don't love them, they're going to react to you without respect. Ladies, respect and honor your husband because when you don't, he's not going to give you the love you're looking for. And around and around and around we go. Now, let me tell you something, basic science here. If you look at this, uh, uh, this uh, speaker up here, it is based on this concept. When you take a signal that's coming out of my vocal cords into this microphone, it's being amplified. And the way you amplify it is you put it into a big circle and you spin it really, really fast electronically. And the more you spin it, the louder it gets. So when you get on the crazy cycle, it's just going to get crazier until somebody steps off. One of you all is going to have to obey God and get off the crazy cycle and say, I'm going to love you whether I feel respected or not. Or, I'm going to respect you whether I feel loved or not. <laughs> and when somebody gets off the crazy cycle, it stops. But you know the fun part about the crazy cycle? You can reverse it. You see, with love. Well, she's going to react with lots of respect, boys. You want to feel respected? Love your wife. And when you start feeling respected, you're going to love your wife even more. And that's when it gets good. We'll leave that for another message. But anyway... Everybody's blushing now. You know, step back to the slide before this. We talked about the love and respect thing, but Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what does he mean here? He's saying, okay, let's get off of this crazy cycle and, and, and let's understand, let's submit to one another's need. That's what he's saying. Do you see it? He's going, I have to submit to my wife's need to feel respected, whether I like it or not. And she needs to submit to my need to feel honored and respected, whether she likes it or not. 
Now, how does this work in real life? What's an analogy we can use to really kind of get the concept? Well, if you look at that word submit, it's actually a military term. In Greek, it was used in the military. And what it means is a voluntary attitude of cooperating or assuming responsibility isn't carrying a burden. In other words, in the military, if I'm an officer and I give an order, the person I'm giving the order to submits to my authority and goes and does what they're told. That's what this word means. But people in our politically worried, correct world, they don't understand what the Bible is saying here. They think that it's saying, oh, women, you need to submit and be a doormat. That is not what it says. It says submit to one another. It says submit to the need that the other person has. So it would look like this. That's what it would look like. You see, I have two sons in the Navy. Actually, one just got out of the Navy, so Navy veteran and one still in the Navy. And I was uh, out at sea with my son a couple weeks back on the USS Stennis. I was out there for a week. The food is terrible in the Navy. How many of you know this? Horrible. Don't join the Navy for the food. But anyway, the food was horrible. But one of the things that I, I, I saw, I witnessed it, was the interaction between the captain and his first officer. There was a mutual respect there. You see, the captain was in command of the ship, but the captain always worked through the first officer. It was always the first officer on one MC that was coming up and telling us stuff. And the captain says this, and the captain says that. It was rare to hear the captain. I think we heard the captain like once. That's the time it was the XL. Because the captain works through the exo. And there, there's, a, there's a mutual submission that goes back and forth. Now, what I've learned about captains and first officers is the captain has a responsibility for that entire aircraft carrier, the whole air wing, and everybody else. There's 7,000 people under your command. That's a lot of responsibility. And, and, and when you've got that much responsibility on your shoulders, you need a trustworthy first officer. Somebody that's not going to tear you down in front of the crew. Somebody that if they have a disagreement with you, they are professional enough to pull you aside and say, Captain, with all due respect, I have an issue with that order and I need to talk to you about it. They would never do that in front of the crew. Never, ever. Because they respect the captain. But the captain understands that I need a first officer I can trust to tell me what I don't want to hear. Now, a good husband trusts a wife that's going to tell him what he doesn't want to hear. But a good wife will submit to his need to feel honored and respected as the captain of his ship. That's how it's supposed to look. That's what this means. That's why he uses a military term. In fact, that word respect, I told you, is phobos. It means to show a reverential fear. And what he's saying is, look, the captain of the ship makes the final call on whether or not we're turning left or right. But he works through the the first officer to get it done. And the first officer needs to be the trustworthy person that, that would never tear down the captain in front of the crew, but will say what needs to be said. My wife has many times told me things I don't want to hear. It's really annoying when she's right. But never in front of the crew, my children. Never that would be disrespecting the captain of the ship. You wouldn't do that. You want to have a great marriage? Then do what the Bible says. Ladies, start learning to function as the first officer on this ship. Gentlemen, be a great captain. Work through your first officer, not around her, not pounding her in the head, certainly not taking her for granted. You run everything through your first officer. You don't make a call until you hear what the first officer has to say doesn't mean you always do what your first officer says, but you always listen. Why? Because you love her. Do you see how this works? Who can say right now, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. See, that's the Bible. The Bible's cool. The Bible's just plain cool. It gets it right every time. And you know what, I, what I've learned here? 
there's more to it than this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here in just a few minutes. Hopefully I'm not boring you. I'll give you just a few more minutes, is that okay? Now, I wanna take this a little deeper, guys. Go back to Ephesians again, verse, uh, chapter five, verse 25. It, it goes, it wants you to understand this a little deeper. Remember I said, men, you reflect the image of God. Women, you reflect the image of God in a different way, right? Well, look at what it says here. It says, husbands, and it's, it's pointing it at you. It says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's interesting, the Bible calls the church the bride of Christ in order to get this analogy really clear. What he's saying is that God is commanding me as a husband. He's saying to me, Pat, you need to love your wife so much that you would be willing to be tortured for a crime she is guilty of. And you had nothing to do with it. You have to love your wife so much, you're willing to get in her place. You are willing to take life right on the chin for her. There are too many husbands that, are, that are, are, are so demanding of their wife, they're not treating her like that crystal vase. Instead, they're, they're, they're expecting her to, to take, it on, take life the same way. No, you're supposed to love your wife that much because you reflect the image of God, gentlemen. And that's how much God loved you. Hmm. So if you want to keep it all together in your marriage, you need to submit to each other's need instead of demanding that your own needs get met. But let's think about this. And let me close with this. I said, I have three sons and I would not give one for any person. I wouldn't give one for my own wife. I wouldn't. I mean, if it comes down to it and you, you know, my son or my life, take me, right? How many of you understand love like that? How many of you have children and understand a love like that? But God says, I loved people who hated me. I created them to reflect who I am, but they don't. They betrayed me. But I love them so much. I'll give my only son to pay for their crimes. That's what it means when God says that he loves you. Now let's think about this for a second. Every single one of you were created to live for God, but you don't. You live for yourself. Every last one of you, including me. How many of you are willing to admit that? You got a me monster inside of you and it's been driving you your whole life but you were not created to rule yourself. You were not created for yourself. You were created to love him, but you betrayed him. Now, honestly, if you were able to see what that looks like to God, it would probably look something like this. It wouldn't be terribly pretty. It would look, you would be contaminated. You would look filthy. But God loves you regardless of how you look. God chooses to love you with a love so great he would give his own son for you. Now, I just want to tie it up with this. Let's do a quick review. You want to keep it all together in your marriage. It starts with understanding that God invented this. So you got to do it his way, right? Right? If you want to have a great marriage, you got to do it his way. And he said, I made men and women different to reflect me. And men are designed to reflect God with honor and respect and, and, and admiration. And women are designed to reflect me with, with love and, and cherishing and with, with, with care and with a concern and all the things that, that, that are natural to women. And you, if you want to have a great marriage, you need to submit to one another's need. Men need to submit to her need to be loved. She needs to submit to my need to be respected, but you know what? 
There's a me monster in us. You can't do this without his help. Let me say that again. You can't do this without his help. Gentlemen, you can't love your wife like this. It's a bar too high, not without God's help, not without connecting with him all the time to get the strength to do it, especially when you fail. You want to have a great marriage? You've got to get yourself committed to God. You've got to get connected to God. You need his power or you're never going to get there. Ladies, you cannot respect your husband in a way that will be meaningful to him and that's going to work and that's going to result in you being loved back without God's help. You cannot do it, especially when you know his faults very well. How are you going to get past that? Only with the power of God. So if you do not have the Spirit of God working in and through you, this will never work. But if you do, you can have a great marriage and you can keep it all together. Let's pray about this.